Thank you. So I would like to start this talk with a confession. So I'm a compiler guy. And uh, my day job is to improve compilers and make them better. I even teaching advanced compiler construction at the university, writing papers about compilers. So at this point, you might wonder, uh, what am I doing here? So what, what is the connection between the compilers and big data? And uh, maybe it's not a big spoiler that there is a lot of connections. And maybe you can recognize some of the frameworks on this slide. All of these flame frameworks have compilers included in some way or others. Uh, and uh, I will talk about uh, Apache Flink, Apache Spark, and also about TensorFlow. I think it's uh, not hard to uh, think uh, where the compiler is within Hive. So basically every time when you are using these frameworks, you are using compilers in a way uh, that you might uh, not expect it. And in fact, compilers are everywhere. So not just in big data frameworks, but also, for example, within browsers. Browsers are like a compilation of compilers. There are lots of them in a browser, for example, for HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. In every database system, there are compilers to com compile your queries. Even in your graphics drivers, there are compilers that are, for example, compiling your uh, shader programs to the cart that you are using. So why do we use compilers? Uh, most of the time, we use compilers to get performance. So the question is, why do we want performance? Of course, performance is cool. Everybody wants to write uh, fast applications. But we have lots of shiny servers to run our applications on. So does performance matter at all? And yes, it matters. For example, uh, if we write more performant code or write more performant applications, then then uh, we have less cost, less infrastructure cost, less electricity cost. So uh, we can increase the profit of the company that we are working for. So what it comes down to basically it's money. So we want to have good performance to generate more money. Or in case you cannot relate with that, we can also write performant applications to to the, for the environment. So if our applications are more efficient, they are consuming less electricity, so we will cause less pollution. So it's a big win. So let's start with a quick recap with the history of uh, big data. Not a too detailed one, but, um, but just a short overview. So early clusters was like this, very heterogeneous. There are lots of small gears. Every gear has a different shape, different size, different color. So early clusters uh, were heterogeneous. All of the nodes might have different architecture, different uh, operating system. And uh, it was a challenge to write application that we can run on such systems. And of course, one of the big bottleneck was the IO, the network IO or the hard drive IO. So most of the applications uh, weren't uh, bottlenecked on the CPU, but on some IO operation. We even uh, went to the extremes and, uh, well, Actually, if you think of HDFS, there are even a file system which is implemented in Java, implemented in, in a garbage collected lang language, a file system which is inherently a low level layer that is usually part of the operating system, sometimes running in the kernel space. So 
even this low level concept is uh, re implemented in a high level garbage collected language. And for the because of the garbage collector and the poses, uh, it has a bigger latency. And there are even some companies, for example, MapR, when, where one of the selling points of their product is that they rewrote uh, the HDFS in, in a native language, so they have much smaller latencies, so they can, um, they can have a better performance in some sense. And also, the early big data applications were doing batch jobs. And when we are talking about batch jobs, we do not care that much about latency. What we really care about is throughput. And garbage collection can be uh, very, can have very reasonable performance, a modern garbage collector, when it comes to throughput. I have a second convention to make. It's still not a coming out, so don't worry. I'm a native developer. So I'm, so I'm developing native applications. Moreover, I'm developing compilers for native languages in native, in a nat native language. So I'm a little bit biased, but even though I am biased, I'm not here to bash anyone for his decisions because in that environment I described earlier, it made a lot of sense to use a JVM language. So I think at that time, it was a pretty good choice to implement our frameworks in JVM. So that was a good choice. But what happened since then? I ran out of stock photos, but uh, what happened in the big data scheme? Uh, we are now using more sophisticated algorithms that uh, are using more CPU. And also, uh, CPUs can scale better. So in case we are not utilizing uh, CPU, it can uh, reduce its uh, frequency, its clock frequency, and it can uh, save power. So even if our application is now bottlenecked on the I.O., then it is worth to keep the CPU frequency low so we can save energy. And uh, also with innovations in networking or storage, uh, we can have lower latencies and also better throughput. So IO is less of a bottleneck nowadays than it used to be. And also now we are not only thinking about batch jobs, we are also writing streaming apps. And when it comes to streaming, it's an entirely different uh, beast. So in this case, we are no longer only care about the throughput, but we also care about the latency. So what's now? CPU now is a bottleneck. Energy cost is important. So how, what should we do? One possibility would be to rewrite everything in C++, but I think nobody wants to do that. So maybe we can use the JVM in a more creative way. And sometimes what it comes down to is to manage, manage memory. So lo lots of the frameworks does manual memory management. So that might be ridiculous at first, first sight, we are using a garbage collected language and we are managing the memory manually. And one might uh, wonder, modern garbage collectors are pretty good. So how is it possible that uh, manual memory management can do better? Because one of the reasons is that manual me memory management have something that none of the garbage collectors have. And it's domain specific knowledge. So encoding the this domain specific knowledge into the allocation patterns uh, can save us a lot of time. Uh, there is a link that, uh, for a blog post that uh, you should read because I think it's uh, pretty good. And uh, the, what is nice, when you are using these frameworks, when you write application code, you can still use the garbage collector. The memory management is still automatic. This manual memory management is only used 
within the framework somewhere deep that you do not need to know about. So only the framework writers need to do this. How, is, how can you do manual memory management in Java? You can, for example, allocate a huge array of bytes, and then you can write your own allocator on top of it. So basically, that's what they are doing. And in Apache Fling, for example, uh, they do other optimizations. For example, when we are dealing with big data, sometimes we cannot fit our data set into the memory. So what we are doing, we are loading chunks of data into the memory, process it, and write it out, and then process the next chunk. So the question is, how can we make it more efficient? And one of the ways to make it more efficient is to be able to do it using bigger chunks. And if we are having some kind of memory overhead from the J Java object model, then we can do smaller chunks. So what we can do, stop using the Java object model, and instead of working on Java objects, we can work on raw data. And this way, we can fit more data into our memory. We can work on bigger chunks, and we can have better performance. So this basically means uh, for Apache Flink that Apache Flink is work some, most of the time on serialized data. Not so not on, the framework not only serializes the objects for sending over the network or writing it out to the disk, but for example, some of the processing like sorting the data can be done on the serialized format. And when we are using serialization extensively, then serial serialization can become a bottleneck. So what's the problem with this serialization? In case of Flink, this is a code snippet from Apache Flink. This is how plain old Java objects are serialized. So there is a loop that for all fields, we are using reflection to get the value of a field in case that field was a null, then we write out a Boolean flag that it was a null. In case it wasn't null, we write out a Boolean flag it wasn't null, and then we call the appropriate serializer for that field. So the problem is, one of the problem is that uh, the number of fields is different for each of the plain or Java objects. So the JVM cannot unroll this loop. And in case it cannot unroll this loop, it cannot inline the call to the serializer, to the fields serializer. So we lose lots of optimization opportunities. And also, we are using reflection to get the values of the fields, which is very slow. And we need to add extra code to deal with subclasses. And there are, of course, the null checks I was speaking about. So the problem is this code is correct for the general case, and there is no specialization. So it would be better to have specialized code for each of the plain old Java objects that are only good at serializing that object type, but it can do it very quickly. So how Flink worked from the high level overview. When there is a plain old Java object, it, have a run, it has a runtime type, Flink has a runtime type, type system. So we have a type, sys, type info for that. The type info will create the serializer and the same serializer will then serialize different uh, plain old Java objects. And when we add code generation, runtime code generation to the scheme. So in case we would like to generate specialized serializers for each of the different plain old Java objects, then we have a slightly different pipeline. So using a template and the type information, we can generate Java code at runtime. We can use a compiler at runtime to compile the Java code and then we will get a class loader that we can use to load this serializer. And uh, 
then the just generated serializer can be used for only one type of objects, but it can serialize that type of object very efficiently. One of the problem is that we also have to serialize the serializers because we are talking about clusters and data are going everywhere. So sometimes serializers are, are written out to the disk. Sometimes the nodes are sending serializers to each other. So what happens when we have multiple nodes? So let's imagine JVM A compiles one of the one of the generated serializer, and we want to send that serializer over the network to JVMB. The problem is that JVMB have no knowledge about the class of this serializer because it wasn't compiled on JVMB, so we cannot deserialize it because we cannot deserialize an object that we do not know what class it belongs to. So we can introduce a wrapper. So instead of sending the serializer over the network, we can send the code of the serializer and we can recompile that code on the other JVM and use the recompiled code. So let's try this out. And when I tried it out, I got an exception like this. Serializer A cannot be cast to serializer A. So it's the same type. I was a bit surprised. And what happens in the background is Java do not use a nominal type system. So two types in order to be equi equivalent, it is not enough their name to be equal, but also they need to be loaded with the same class loader. So in case I'm loading the same Java class with two different class loaders, then I will end up with two different types that happen to have the same names. So basically, it's, it's the kind of black magic that we need to deal with when we are adding code generation to this framework. And the good news is that uh, you do not need to do that work because that, that is already done. It was done in a Google Summer of Code project. And the result was a 20% improvement of performance, which is significant. And why do I say that it is significant? Because uh, it means 20% less electricity cost, or it can mean 20% more users. And for example, in case of Facebook, Andrei Alexandrescu once said uh, when he optimized 1% on the back end of Facebook, he could uh, save the company uh, 10 years of his salary each month only on the electricity costs. So it can be quite significant. So that's, that was about Apache Flink. And let's talk about Spark. Spark is very similar to Apache Flink. And in fact, Spark is using very similar techniques. So for example, Spark is also using manual memory management within and uh, it, is, it is also using runtime code generation. And you can read about this, this stuff. It is codenamed Project Tungsten. So uh, there is a nice blog post that they are implemented to make the performance better. And for example, in case of TensorFlow, the 1.0 release of TensorFlow included a new backend called XLA. And XLA used the, I think it stands for Accelerated Linear Algebra. So it's a, it's a kind of an intermediate representation that then uses LLVM to compile it down to the platform that you are using. So using this chain of compilers, uh, they were able to improve the performance of TensorFlow significantly on some workflows, even 50% uh, speed up was possible. So basically introducing compiler technology into an existing big data or machine learning framework can be a huge win. So what are the conclusions? We are living in, 
interesting times because it looks like most of the frameworks are just realized in the last one or two years. It is very useful to include much compiler technology into the stack that, you're, that we are using. And nowadays, almost all of the popular frameworks have lots of compilers included. And uh, that can help the performance a lot. So do you need to study compiler technology? And the answer is no. If you are developing applications and uh, you are using these frameworks, you do not need to know about uh, all these optimizations that these frameworks are doing. But awareness, awareness might help. So in case you are debugging an, a hard issue, it, it is good to know what happens in the background. Even if you do not have a detailed knowledge of compiler technology, it is good to have a high-level overview what happens, so it makes you easier to debug that particular problem in case it is related to that part of the framework. But if you are a framework developer, then you need to think about compilers, and in case you are looking into improving the performance of the framework that you are working with, then you should look out for opportunities from a compiler developer's point of view. Well, thank you for your attention.